I'm Dr. Vitka from Dr. Vitka's Myths, Legends, and Lore, and we're here in Bangor, Maine. So more than anything in Bangor, I was looking forward to visiting the International Cryptozoology Museum's outpost here in Bangor. Unfortunately, though, the sign says closed for the winter. The winter can be really long up here, so we're not going to be getting warm with Bigfoot, at least not today. Tomorrow, hopefully, we'll be checking out the Portland version. Luke, come on. We found it. Stephen King's house. This is the residence of the modern master of literary terror, <laughs> Stephen King. Luke's barking. He wanted to come here. He was trying to audition for the remake of Cujo. I think he can get the part. Now on a day like this, it's cold, so Mr. King is probably in Florida, but uh, still, just appreciate this beautiful, creepy spider fence. This is the house that incubated it. Stephen King wrote it here in Bangor. Also, Paul Bunyan was in it. <laughs> Pet Cemetery was inspired by events that happened to Stephen King in nearby Orrington. This is a house of horror. Literary horror. As far as I know, nothing bad actually happened here. Salem's Lot was also inspired by main locations. Stephen King's home. Now you've seen it! <laughs> I've got my lumberjack shirt on today. We're going to meet the giant hairy monster that stalks through the woods. Well, you thought I was talking about Bigfoot. Well, we're going to meet Bigfoot a little bit later. But first, we're going to see Paul Bunyan. Yes, the enormous lumberjack. His home is in Bangor, Maine. Paul Bunyan was a giant of a man. Some Folklore says he was like seven feet tall. Others say he was taller than the tallest buildings. The Paul Bunyan statue in Bangor, Maine stands 31 feet tall and is arguably the tallest of the Bunyans. It all depends on how you measure it. When measuring a Paul Bunyan statue, are you supposed to measure from the base? Paul Bunyan statues dot the landscape of the United States. Most of them are hideous, converted muffler men. But the one in Bangor is different. Commissioned to be made by a real artist. Paul Bunyan is handsome, and he's huge with a mighty axe. Paul Bunyan is the rugged picture of an American frontiersman. And it's claimed that the Bangor Bunyan, at 31 feet tall, is the biggest of the Bunyans. It's not but it is the most effective. It's the most impressive. It's the one that conveys the mighty figure of Paul Bunyan the best. The stories of Paul Bunyan evolved in logging camps. When the brave loggers weren't out logging, they were telling each other tall tales to pass the time. Bunyan was an American folklore creation, possibly based on French Canadian folklore. They say that Paul Bunyan was a great big man who one day appeared in a lumber camp. He became a lumberjack, and he was so big, with one swing of his mighty axe, he could take down an entire forest. He was so big that once after the lumber season was done, he lumbered across the country and lazily let his axe drag behind him, and it created the Grand Canyon just by dragging. I love the Paul Bunyan stories, especially the ones about how much food he could consume. They say that he ate so much, he would have a mountain of pancakes every morning for breakfast. And as soon as he was done with breakfast and he went to work, the cook had to start working on his dinner. The skillet his pancakes were cooked in was so big, it was like an ice hockey rink. And the cook would strap whole hams to his feet and skate around in the skillet to grease it up to start cooking the next meal. Bunyan also loved his meat. They say he would eat a mile of red horse at every meal. That sounds disgusting. Who eats horses? Well, Paul Bunyan wasn't eating horses. 
Red Horse is what the Lumberjacks called corned beef. So next time you're at the diner, make sure you order some Red Horse and see what happens. As the stories evolved, he kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Paul Bunyan was lonely, and he got a pet, a friend, a gigantic blue ox. Also, in some of the Paul Bunyan narratives, there was a year where it snowed blue. Paul Bunyan couldn't have a normal-sized girlfriend. He'd uh, squash her. So, he found a giant girlfriend. There's a whole Bunyan family out there. But he served a bigger purpose. Some historians think that the Paul Bunyan stories may have been created as propaganda from one of the logging companies. They think Paul Bunyan might have been created as a way to encourage people to become lumberjacks, or just as a fun little storybook to sell the kids. The truth is, the Paul Bunyan stories existed way beforehand. Paul Bunyan is a creation of American folklore. He was used in advertising. He became a Disney character, and Homer Simpson dressed as him on a great episode of The Simpsons. Paul Bunyan belongs to everyone and everywhere. Where there's woods, you'll find a Paul Bunyan statue. People say he was from Oregon. People say he was from California. People say he was from Minnesota. People say he was from Quebec. And people say he was from Maine. Honestly, the stories grew all over the place, possibly simultaneously. But there's one place in particular which has the best claim to Paul Bunyan. The only place in the United States that has an actual Paul Bunyan birth certificate is right here in Bangor, Maine. If you go to the Bangor City Clerk's office, you'll see framed up on the wall a birth certificate for one Paul Bunyan. An official government document with the name Paul Bunyan and a date of birth from the 1800s it looks like an official government document. Is this proof that Paul Bunyan was a real person and was from Bangor, Maine? Well, it's right there in black and white. It's probably fake. But I choose to believe that Paul Bunyan comes from Bangor, Maine. So next time you go through Bangor, pay tribute to the ultimate woodsman. Say hello to Paul Bunyan. finally saw the local wildlife. One of the most important things in Maine are lobsters, or is lobsters? Anyway, lobsters. Here is the Maine Lobsterman statue in Portland. It was made for the 1939 World's Fair to celebrate the Maine Lobstermen. Maine and lobsters are intrinsically entwined. You can't come to Maine without marveling at the lobster. And in downtown Portland, there's a statue that's a salute to the brave souls who go out into the freezing sea to collect nature's delicious bounty. In the early days of recorded New England history, they say that the lobsters washing up on the shores in Maine were so large they were as big as people. There's early colonial accounts of lobsters being six feet long, the size of men. I mean, honestly, they'd be tiny compared to our hero Paul Bunyan. The statue in downtown Portland, Maine is a salute to the brave lobstermen. Those hardy souls who go out to sea to catch nature's bounty of delicious sea crustaceans. It looks like the guy depicted in the statue is proposing to the lobster, but why not? You're already married to the sea, so you may as well seal the deal with a lovely lobster. In the early days, lobsters were so plentiful, they were considered food only fit for poor people. They were chopped up and used as fertilizer for people's vegetable gardens. They were more valuable as fertilizer than delicious lobster meat. In fact, in Maine, prisoners considered it cruel and unusual punishment to be fed lobster more than several times a week. They rioted, and eventually the state listened to their petition and made it a law that they could only be served lobster twice a week in Maine correctional facilities. We 
finally made it to the International Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, Maine. And believe me, it was worth the wait. We were given limited permission to take a few videos by Doug in the gift shop. Thank you very much for that, Doug. The International Cryptozoology Museum was the brainchild of one Lauren Coleman, eminent cryptozoologist. Cryptozoology is the study of unknown and hidden animals. We tend to think of cryptozoology in terms of Bigfoot and the Chupacabra. For years, it was thought that gorillas were a mythical creature, and that there's no way there could be a ape-like, man-like beast roaming through the African bush. But when gorillas were, and orangutans were finally captured and studied, the truth came out. They do exist! So is it so hard to believe that perhaps in our own densely wooded forests, we might have our own man-apes? I mean, the coelacanth had been extinct for thousands of years, they said. So why not the Gigantopithecus, uh, an extinct ape-man? Perhaps he's still out there. Is he? That's the kind of question that cryptozoology attempts to answer. And Lauren Coleman is, in my opinion, the best cryptozoologist out there. He started in the 1970s as a young man investigating the famed Dover Demon sighting in Dover, Massachusetts. We're eventually going to do a video on the Dover Demon. It was a strange, sickly-looking creature. Skinny, sticky-looking, a big head and glowing eyes. It was seen by a group of teenagers cruising around. They were out for an evening drive when their headlights caught this weird, gnarled thing crawling along a traditional New England stone wall. Cryptozoology is a science, but it's almost magical in its way of thinking. Isn't it more fun to believe that there might be strange animals still hidden than to write off the possibility without even looking for them? One thing that I think is really cool about Lauren Coleman's philosophy of cryptozoology is even if things like Bigfoot and the Chupacabra don't turn out to actually exist, thinking about them gets people interested in science. A kid might go to the Cryptozoology Museum fascinated by the Sasquatch and then upon learning more about the Sasquatch, develop an interest in uh, other natural sciences and regular zoology. It's sort of a gateway drug to the sciences. So in addition to being a lot of fun, this museum, I think, is a valuable service to the scientific community. Don't write off cryptozoology just because the thought of Bigfoot makes you uncomfortable. The Cryptozoology Museum is amazing. I would have spent all day in there if Luke hadn't pulled me out to go poop by the Bigfoot statue outside. I highly recommend checking this place out. It's wonderful. It has true scientific artifacts. It has wall-to-wall -wall plaster casts of Bigfoot footprints. It has recreations of the creatures themselves. Also, it has cases full of pop culture representations of the creatures, as well as examples of pseudoscience versus real cryptozoology. If you even have the slightest inclination towards interest in these weird, forbidden, unexplained animals, definitely check out the International Cryptozoology Museum. And it has the best gift shop of any museum around. I say everybody needs to check this place out. If you like Bigfoot, if you believe in Bigfoot, you can be here all day. Even if you don't, you'll have the best time of your vacation. I love the Cryptozoology Museum. And make sure next time you're in Portland to say hello to Bigfoot. And remember, like and subscribe so I can start making money on these videos and afford to live in a beautiful mansion in Maine too.